I'd like to call to order the Township North Huntington Board of Commissioners special meeting for Thursday, March 14th at 7 p.m. <coughs> Roll call, Manager Silka. Commissioner Haggis. Here. Commissioner Harold. Here. Commissioner Bertani. Here. Commissioner Martino. Here. Commissioner Bevan. Here. Commissioner Casera. Here. Could everyone please stand and rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Pledge of I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. President, if I may add that, Commissioner Blasco is present also. Okay. <laughs> wow, Jeff. I, uh, I'm sure I played it. You were for the last one. If any residents would like to speak tonight, they could sign the book of the podium. First resident is Dietra Petrovito. Pevarado, sorry. This uh, name and address for the record, please. You can come up to the podium. 2316 Lindale Court, North Huntington, 15642. Go ahead. Just go ahead? Yep. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I am Dietrich Pivarado. I am a North uh, Huntington resident. I'm here to state my concerns regarding the houses uh, in our single family zoned neighborhoods that are currently being used as hotels, boarding, rooming uh, houses. I have here with me tonight several neighbors who also share my concern. A little history that's led to this concern uh, recently in our neighborhood, Knight's Landing. A five bedroom house was sold to a gentleman that never occupied the house. He did a lot of renovations on the house. He rented the house out to a man who owns a construction company who was housing 10 plus of his workers on a three month lease. After zoning uh, was made aware of the violation to our single family zone neighborhood, the number of occupants went down from uh, to eight and then to seven. The property owner was not returning phone calls or responding to any letters from the zoning department. The lessee, which was the construction company's owner, claimed that they were a single family. Now, North Huntington is growing fast, we all know that. And with growth also comes the challenge to the zoning of our neighborhoods. There will be those who will try to circumvent the present ordinances, and it's for this reason that we need North Huntington to be proactive to make sure that our ordinance protect not only the residents of North Huntington, but also North Huntington Township as a whole. This is a nice place to live. That's why people come here. A lot of people move here because it's nice. What makes it, ni what makes it nice is that we enjoy a quiet, safe, low density neighborhoods that are well maintained to reside and raise our families. There's a known factor to these stable environments and that's why they are safe. We all know our neighbors. This is the intention of the single family zoned neighborhoods. The ordinance are designed for our protection to preserve this. We as property owners have a considerable financial as well as community investment in our neighborhoods. And as a result, our property values continue to increase and North Huntington continues to flourish. By allowing our houses to be used as hotels and boarding and room and houses, we diminish the very thing that makes our neighborhood so attractive and adds value to our properties. Transient type housing, such as boarding and rooming houses, increases the number of people that have no investment in the property or community. It compromises the safety and the integrity of our neighborhoods and opens the door to future problems. 
There are several things that I would like to see happen as a result of this request. The definitions of single family and commercial boarding homes need to be further defined. There can be no question as to how the property is intended to be used and is actually being used. Also, enforcement steps need to be in place to verify who's actually living there and that they actually meet the requirements. In regard to rentals, we need to establish in North Huntington a way to handle the increasing number of rentals in the township. Currently, I am not aware that we have anything in place in North Huntington that has any type of um, registration for these rental, these houses that are being rented out. Uh, we have no way to handle the increasing number in the township. So. You do just a basic any search on the internet and you'll come up with a plethora of reasons of why you need to regulate your uh, rentals. It's been a proven problem in other towns in respect to property damage, safety, and use of public resources. All these things result in an increasing cost to the township. Also, it allows the property owner to be unreachable, which would appear to be their intent. In closing, Article 2 of the Zoning Ordinances state, and I'll quote, I'll just read it, the purpose of our ordinances is to promote and protect the public health, safety, and welfare of its inhabitants, of the North Huntington Township and the public in general. It's also to encourage and facilitate orderly growth and expansion of the municipality and to protect the character and maintain the stability of residential business and manufacturing areas within the township. It's our hope that the commissioners who work on our behalf will exercise due diligence in addressing our concerns and protecting our single family zone neighborhoods through revision of our ordinances. They need to be reviewed and set up a monitoring system of the rentals in our township. You need to know who's coming here. You need to know how to find the property owners. You need to make sure there's inspections on the property. If you want to continue in the direction which is a positive direction of North Huntington, you have to be proactive. This is the time to do it. I came from Monroeville. I grew up in Monroeville, and this happened right across the street from me, which is why I'm interested in this so passionately. I watched the house across the street from me turn into a boarding house, which eventually became a drug house, which was in disrepair, cars coming and going, and I mean, that's a whole other thing I could talk to you about. Um, so I speak from experience, not fear. I know it's coming down the road. We are in a unique position right now. It's a cautionary tale, what happened in my neighborhood, which I would never thought had happened in my neighborhood, Knight's Landing. Possibly happening already in other places, just nobody spoke up. Well, I'm speaking up to my council, to my commissioners, and asking for your help. Thank you for your time, consideration, and I'll take any questions if you have any questions. No, the way citizens input works, we, we will, uh, we'll respond after all citizens come up and are able to speak. Okay. All right. Well, yep. I'm here for you. All right. Thanks. 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 Uh, next resident is Angela Schlegel. 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 Good evening. My name is Angela Schlegel. I am a resident of Lindo Court as well. Um, I also have experience, and that's why this situation concerns me. Um, we moved here about five years ago, a little over five years ago, actually, from Penn Hills. Um, December of 2011, I went down the street to pick up candy from a neighborhood child. Um, I knocked on the door and found a mattress in the living room on the floor. At that point in time, I realized my neighborhood had officially changed. Um, after talking with some of the neighbors, we realized that there are multiple families living in that house to get a better education for their children. They were living there illegally. I didn't escalate my concerns at that time to the township. 
I didn't try to change the situation, and I did nothing to protect my neighbors. I moved. I thought I was making a move to a better place and making a substantial long-term investment in a very stable neighborhood. And as Dietra Pivarado spoke, uh, you know, we learned that there were 10 to 12 grown men living in a house down the street from us. I want to feel safe on my street and not feel like I'm living down the road from a red roof or an extended stay suites. One of the neighbors did a ton of legwork and brought the attention of the situation to the attention of the township zoning people. As a result of her dedication and the follow-up by the township, uh, my understanding is we're down to about seven or eight men in that house now, so I do appreciate that improvement. But I want to voice my concern as the citizen of North Huntington and make a few points and suggestions. I don't know what the processes and procedures are in place to govern and oversee rental arrangements in the township, but it appears there's a lack of transparency and visibility into who is renting their property and to whom they're renting their property. Based on my observations, there also appears to be no proactive process in place to ensure that renters are in compliance with those zoning regulations. And I don't know anything about residency requirements as they relate to income tax collection, but I hope that a repercussion of the lack of visibility didn't result in a lack of income in tax revenue for the township as a result of these 10, 12, 10 to 12 wage owners living in that residence. So in closing, I ask that you help protect North Huntington. You know, obviously, I suggest that a review of associated policies and procedures be completed to ensure that we're keeping up with the times and the situations that are arising and appropriately addressing topics related to rental visibility, notification, local wage tax, single family dwelling zoning rules, regulations, proof of that zoning adherence, and any other related concerns. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I guess, Andy, could you shed some light on any of this? I can. Uh, Jeff may be able to add some as well. Okay. <clears throat> um, indeed, Knight's Landing is a residential zoning district. I believe it's R3. And um, anything other than single family homes is not permitted in an R3 zoning district. Our zoning ordinance defines a family as a single person occupying a dwelling unit, two or more persons related by blood or marriage occupying a dwelling unit, or uh, not more than four unrelated persons occupying a dwelling unit and living together and maintaining a common household. Um, I understand that this situation took care of itself today, that they have moved out, is that correct? If you don't mind, you want to come up to the podium? Thank you. They did, in fact, leave today. I saw them leaving. Um, he had said that his um, project was over. Uh, I do know that the house this weekend was put back on the market. The whole time that the owner has had this, even while it was being rented out, the sign remained in the yard, uh, even though if you went online, it was off market. Uh, I do know from some um, people that I talked to in Monroeville in a house, uh, this gentleman that bought the house, he also has done the exact same thing that he's doing in North uh, Knights Landing in Monroeville. So the fact that this single family definition isn't clear this man who is housing his work crew was able to stay under there because he said that he, uh, it was him, the construction owner, company owner, his two sons, and a son-in-law, and three workers. They were there for work. Um, he was housing them there for $5,500 a month, I was told. Um, it's cheaper to do that for them to do that than an extended stay, I believe, is why he did it. It doesn't really matter why uh, he was there. Um, I have appealed the zoning decision that they fit the fam single family definition because clearly they do not. <laughs> they circumvented the terminology. 
uh, the terminology lists A, B, or C. So you can't be A, a sole person, and B, married and related. So I feel, and this is probably going too far because I have an appeal that's going to be scheduled. I feel it's pretty transparent and pretty obvious what the relationship. This was a commercial relationship. He was boarding his workers. This was not a familial relationship. And uh, that's why it concerns me that they were able to do this. And now I paid $300 to have an appeal scheduled for April. Going forward, I think the question is, do we want to regulate rental properties? We had discussed this when John Shepard was here. I believe it was North for Sales had passed a, a rental property ordinance. And the argument is, is twofold from a municipality standpoint. Certainly the most obvious reason is from a health and safety standpoint. You want to make sure that with rental properties, there's a smoke detector, there's a fire extinguisher, there's adequate exits uh, and, and means of ingress and egress should there be a, a fire or an emergency in a home. You want to make sure that rooms that are being used as bedrooms, in fact, meet the building code requirements for a bedroom with a way out and a large enough window that somebody can get through. Um, we require an occupancy permit currently at the conclusion of construction of a new home, but we never look at it again. Other municipalities have taken this on and said they do want to look at it every time a tenant changes, and certainly the first step for that is knowing what properties are rental properties versus what are owner occupied. The other argument, and you, depending on which side you're coming from, you could argue this is more important or less important, but um, I rented a, an apartment many years ago in a neighboring municipality. Within 10 days, 20 days of, of occupying a rental unit there, you had to register with the municipality I think their objective was to make sure they got your earned income tax. That's a valid reason too. But um, those are certainly things that we may want to consider. They have been discussed internally and the decision was made by Manager Shepard not to pursue this. Um, it would involve a lot of staff time. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, if there's a, a fee structure to recoup some type of uh, fee every time there's a change in tenants and a premises is inspected, well, it may pay for itself. But I don't think you're going to do this without adding a significant amount of man hours. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. Just realize that going in. But we could certainly do some research and find out what other municipalities around us have done, what their experience has been. Uh, has it been a good thing, a bad thing? Has it improved uh, conditions and prevented problems? That, that's the board's call. Do you have anything to add? I really don't have that much to add other than you have to watch when you go, when you try to paint with a broad brush, especially the definition of rentals. Probably the one thing for this area that it's holding it back is its lack of rental housing, its lack of housing options. Even if you look at, at the downtown Pittsburgh market, the real estate market over the last five years have been building high-end rental units. So that's, you know, you have to watch that not, you know, I'm speaking as somebody who chooses the lease rather than the own is that you know you if you paint a broad brush you you get yourself back into corners with fair housing violations and some other issues you know also you know i will say that uh, I, somebody who's written two rental ordinances in my career probably about 200 hours of staff time put into those never to be passed because of the pushback and because of the political ramifications it can be done it cannot be done with our current staffing there's no way we can effectively administer a rental registration rental inspection ordinance with our current staff structures so that and there's, and there's no ways that the fees generated would be able to offset probably a full-time inspector and a part-time clerical so that's there is there's issues you know is the ordinance is the language in our ordinance currently vague yes um you know how, how do you count we we've had countless arguments internally how do you count when they violate the fourth uh, unrelated person so there is you know some enforcement areas that be done but 
you know, if if you if the board wants to go down the rental ordinance registration path, I would you know urge caution because it's not a fix all. It's not a uh, you know it's not easy, and at the same time, it's not I, I don't think a major problem within within the you know within the township. So there's some some local issues, and, and if it's local, it's definitely an issue for those people. However, I think you know as we take a look at the definitions, take a look at the code, and take a look at our enforcement, how we enforce those especially when we know of active violations, you know, we can tighten our belts a little bit on, on that area. Yeah, I agree. We need to be a little bit more proactive uh, than reactive, but maybe again, looking at the definition, as we're saying for single family dwellings and maybe cutting that number from four to three is again, something to discuss. And uh, Dietro and Angela, when you said that they listed the house, they list it as like a for sale by owner as an MLS listing. Is it rented or, okay. So it's, they're looking to sell the entire property not just rent out the property. Right. It's back on the market. Okay. Thank you. Dietra, um, at that house, did all these people have vehicles? Initially, there were four vehicles. And um, after it went down to seven, eight, then they just had the two trucks. And then they always had a, um, a detached trailer also in the driveway, a large detached trailer. Did you happen to get any license plate numbers and possibly see where they're from? I mean, see um, for local or see for? They're out of state. Out of state. Mm -hmm. They Texas are out probably. of state, um, if I remember correctly. Um, California, Louisiana, Arizona. Well, yeah. I don't know how you can believe that they are related without actually having some kind of documentation. You know, so how do you how do you know that? they are in this house legally then because without any kind of documentation how how do you even know that they can say we're related we're in-laws whatever mm -hmm. but to do that you know we would have to have some kind of documentation but i do believe that we should be proactive on this because um across our state we see this in reading in scranton mm -hmm. i mean in scranton Lou Barletta was the mayor of Scranton, and he tried to do something about it. They had up to 20, 25 people living in one, one rental property. You can't do that. The town became so dangerous that his residents couldn't go out on the streets. Right. So I believe that we really should be proactive. If we have to look at our policies and procedures and do something before something happens, I think it's worthwhile. Thank you. Teacher, were any of the vehicles that were there, were they your standard Chevy Dodge Ford kind of trucks, or we had like commercial construction vehicles? We, we had residents in speaking about oversized vehicles that aren't supposed to be parked in residential areas. They were large, what's the definition? Extended okay. cab trucks, SUV, and a car. And I, and I believe, Chief Rizzo, we, there have been no police uh, calls or anything, security. Um, Okay. I actually had you know, during the during the complaint process. I ran that property. There's been no uh, police activity there for since 2016 when there's a minor domestic. Okay. Mm -hmm. The problem, if I may speak, um, the problem uh, is that these people come and go. It's right. a revolving door, so you don't know what's coming next, and you don't know what the next. Um, sorry. So the people that are in that house are very transient people. They are. They're transient and they're not workers. not always the same people. Well, that's what I'm afraid of. This just came to our attention um, in January. So they left today. They were supposed to be out March 1st, and then they came up to the zoning and asked for and told them that they extended, had to extend their lease, or they extended their lease two more weeks. And um, they were not fined because they fit under the family, single family definition for the reason I just told you. Um, Tom checked their IDs. Six out of the seven showed up. And um, I personally don't, three of them had the same, I guess, name. I don't know who the fourth person, I don't know who these people are. I filed a right to know, which I was told um, is going to be delayed for further information. Because I was concerned about the public safety of our neighborhoods with these people who we don't know. 
you know, the gentleman who bought the house, if he would have just moved into the house, like everybody else does, or it, even if he rented, because leasing, you're allowed to lease, but to a single family. If a single family would have showed up that was leasing the house, we would know these people. I went through two, a uh, couple dozen chocolate chip cookie batches waiting for this guy to show up to welcome him <laughs> to the neighborhood. <laughs> so um, he never, he never moved in. And um, with these particular people that were in there now, we were fortunate. We don't know who else is going to be showing up. If the house doesn't sell and it's rented out again, it's Pandora's box. I think it's great Jean's all band together to come here tonight. And, you know, we don't want that or any place like that to turn into a drug house or anything that's going to, you know, you don't de devalue trust me. <laughs> our, our township. So there's enough problems out there we don't need to create and we need to be proactive for sure. Mm -hmm. Bruce, you have any input on this? Well, I. I I think that we've addressed it pretty well. I, I think I'm hearing that this board wants to take a look at our zoning ordinance and look at the definitions. Uh, I think there's some caveats in that there might be a lot of time that has to be expended. Um, sometimes you just need citizens to watch out, like, like this has happened tonight. I've had this situation in other communities, and, and oftentimes once the community becomes aware of a problem, they bring it to the board's attention. Uh, those tenants move out. I'll be honest with you, this, I've, I've been here more than two weeks. I've been here since 2001 or two. First time I've heard this issue. That doesn't mean it wasn't going on or isn't going on. Uh, so I, I, I think that I don't want to, I don't want to appear to be, you know, the sky is falling. I don't think the sky is falling, but again, it's one of these things we should stay proactive on. We should take a look at the zoning ordinance and let's see what we can do to, to maybe tighten it up a little bit in this area and, and still not put in the man hours that are necessary to do the inspections. As and Andy put it perfectly, I mean, you can generate fees from this to pay for the inspections and those kinds of things. And it is a way to catch people that, um, that try to avoid earned income tax. Uh, but again, it's 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 a lot of policing. It's time consuming, and you just have to be willing to say, okay, we're going to hire a couple people, and then they've got to generate the revenues, i.e., um, do the inspections when it comes appropriate to do so. Overall, let's go back and and take another look at the zoning ordinance and see where we can go. Okay. Any other further <laughs> board comments on citizens' input on this topic? Yeah, I d just one other yeah. question, Rizzo, Chief. Um, can we uh, have some extra patrols up there to check it out and everything, just on you know regular basis? It's no, that's, that's absolutely not a problem. Okay. All right. So Thank you, Deidre. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Guess if uh, the staff could just look into the ordinance and maybe come back with some ideas to the board. Mm -hmm. All right. It's the uh, end of citizens' uh, response. Work session discussion topics, Manager Silka. Okay, I just have a few today. Uh, first, I just wanted to give uh, the board an update on the uh, Act 172 public safety uh, tax credit uh, progress. As of February 15th, when it was a deadline for all the uh, eight departments eligible to uh, certify their compliance and their membership, six out of the eight uh, entities did certify and their members are eligible to receive the uh, tax credit for 2018 real estate taxes and earned income tax. The two that aren't are Hartford Heights and Shafton. Uh, the process, and this is something, you know, it's uh, it was written by bureaucrats and we're trying to, uh, you know, stumble through this. The first part is that the fire departments, through their chiefs, certify all of their roster who, who've met the training requirements for the resolution. That's turned into the to my office. And then individual members of those eligible departments have up until April 1st to turn in an individual certification form that they fill out, turn into their chief to certify, then turn in. Then at April 1st is the deadline for that submission. <clears throat> After I get that list, I will bring it to the April meeting to the Board of Commissioners to certify that list eligible for tax credits, at which time I will then issue a uh, 
Act 172 compliance certificate. Then after those eligible members who were certified by the Board of Commissioners pay their, pay their real estate taxes in full, they can then come with that certificate and a receipt from the uh, tax collector and uh, ID to show that they are primary, that's their primary residence and th that they meet the criteria. And then I will you know, issue a refund uh, of the 20% of the real estate tax that was paid. And then whenever they file for, after they file for their earned income tax, they will be able to do the same thing for the earned income tax filing with the tax certificate and, you know, and the ID shows that they are, and the tax certificate, you have to show residency as a primary residence, you just have to show that you live within the uh, township. So children can, you know, you know, and other people who live with, with eligible firefighters. So that's where we are and we're coming through. So at the April meeting, I'll bring that list for your certification. And I, I want to thank the chiefs and the individual firefighters for you know, stumbling through this process with us is it's, it's our first time. It's easy to write an ordinance in a process. It's sometimes it's harder to uh, administer. So everybody was cooperative and did what they needed to do. Okay. If no other question on that, I have a, I received last week a, a request from the borough of Irwin to offer reciprocity for North Huntington residents who volunteer in at the Irwin Volunteer Fire Department and then for Irwin residents who volunteer for North Huntington to have the same uh, Act 172 tax rebate. And you know, that came to me kind of a, as a surprise that the borough of Irwin did not make any contact with me prior to writing their ordinance and prior to putting that language into the resolution that they passed. We had no discussions with them prior. So it, I actually like, I got notified by uh, a reporter who called me to ask me, you know, how we're doing this, and I said, well, I don't know. So uh, then um, their, their manager did uh, forward me the, the documents. And it, as I put in there, there's currently 16 North Huntington residents who volunteer at Irwin. And, uh, you know, reciprocity is something that can be done with the Act. You know, as I wrote in the memo, you know, the act was designed to get community in, in, in involvement within the, the local municipalities. So it, it would be a board decision whether they want to grant the benefit to, to the residents of North Huntington who serve outside of the township. And, you know, I did write, you know, in my memo that to me, unless there's a volunteer fire company who's not accepting new members, that seems to be a benefit to be extended that would not benefit the township to give up that tax money. Yeah, I understand there is some tax dollars to be lost, but and I'm sure there's members on the board here that can speak more of the brotherhood of the fire department. Um, I think the possibility is grandfathering these residents into the program. Um, you know, it's maybe a convenience factor. I'm looking at some of the addresses. Some of these people live hundreds of yards from the Irwin Borough Fire Department compared to several miles from the North Huntington Township. So it's a big brother, little brother community system. I, I don't think that it's a loss. Um, these citizens are donating their time. It's, uh, it's teamwork that's going on between Irwin Borough and North Huntington Township. So I would, if the least, grandfather these residents into this program uh, rather than shut them off and say, well, we appreciate your service, but thanks. So just to expound on that, so somebody, I, well, obviously I know some of the guys that are on the, on the list there. Um, and usually what ends up happening is they usually start out as urban firemen because they're in the borough. And as they grow older and start families, they move outside the borough, but they stay with that fire department. And for me, for instance, I, I grew up in the Circleville area, but I now live in Fairmont Hontown district, but I'm still a Circleville fireman. Um, it's so it's still within the township, but it's still basically the, the, the same, the same, it's the same deal. Um, so the, the only thing I would say, if, if we do decide to do this, and, and I can't remember what our requirements are on our end, but are they the exact same requirements that are in Irwin's? What I was suggesting when we write our resolution that we mandate that it makes. Yes. That makes, I'm pretty sure they're real close, but we make them mandated to our our, our yeah, process. Absolutely, it's got, it's got to, uh, for me to say okie dokie with it. It's got to be the, the exact same. And also, this would not become effective until 2020 because they've already missed the uh, February, the deadline for right. 2018. Yeah, I I agree with Daryl. It should meet our requirements. 
the same. And I don't want to, I'll go along with Brian also. I think that they should get involved in it, even though they don't live in the township, whatever, or they live in the township. But I don't think we should not pay them or give them the opportunity to do that, to get the refund. Okay. But they need to meet the requirements the chiefs have come up with. So probably on top of that, the chiefs need to talk, whoever the in charge of the chiefs this year, should talk to the Irwin chief and say, here's our requirements. You guys need to meet these requirements in order to work. So I'm not sure who's in charge this year. So, and this could go the other way too. I don't know if yes. there may be Irwin residents that are actually township firefighters. So, like I know, pretty sure we have a guy who lives in North Irwin that's one of our firefighters. You are correct. Yeah, so. And I know our, our purpose is to get these individuals to volunteer within North Huntington Township, but humans are creatures of habits, and it's really hard to say, hey, leave your family and go to another family if you want this benefit. I just don't think it's fair to those individuals who sacrifice a lot of their time and you know their day without having their families around them. So I think it's a, a good faith effort by the township. I guess uh, I'd somewhat disagree. I mean, I agree with all the board members saying that you know it's a good faith effort to try to, you know, extend the arm and obviously they volunteer the time but looking down on some of these numbers there's a few of the departments that have a I want to say overabundance but a large amount of members that qualify but looking down the list there's obviously we don't know about two of the departments and didn't turn their numbers in yet but there's at least probably two or three on here that could probably use some of those members that actually to serve in North Huntington Township I mean maybe there's some of those stations are a little bit further away from them but to my opinion, I think we should just do it for North Huntington residents. If it's a board's pleasure to go ahead and extend that to Irwin, I'm okay with that. But I would like to see it just for service at North Huntington Fire Departments. Like I said, I don't know all the membership of all the departments, but I know some have overabundance of members versus some that maybe lack membership. So maybe that would entice some of those people to join up at some of those other departments. I don't know that would really be an enticing for them to move. I think regardless of the benefits, those people love what they do. They're going to volunteer with that department. They're not going to leave for the $200 that they might save. But I think it's really hard to say, go to a different house. It's uh, just not the same. I think everybody needs members, whether it's Irwin or North Huntington. We all, <coughs> excuse me, all the fire companies <coughs> need members. So I think, you know, it's a good thing to, you know, we can do that. and work with her on, on that with their firemen their first responders and they're helping save lives so. as i see board consensus is to go through this there's just one clarification uh as commissioner blasco brought up do you want a grandfather clause in there that it's these members and then going forward no new members or do you want it you know so I, when i do the resolution for the meeting I'd like to say grandfathered. Um, I don't know if there's any junior firefighters that would then fall into that, that would have to look into that, or it's just current active members that would then qualify. But uh, I mean, 16 residents, it's gonna break the bank for us. Again, they're gonna respond to mutual calls if we have emergencies in the township, so. I guess I would be in favor, if it's a board's pleasure, just to do it the current ones and not any new ones. Okay, I just have one issue before we go into the uh, culvert issue that came up after we uh, sent out the uh, packets. As a culvert issue, we'll probably have a little more discussion. Uh, uh, Chief Rizzo received a uh, request from Norwin School District for the a donation of our current Impala. It's a 2014 Impala that we've cycled out of service. We have no use for it in the uh, administration fleet or the codes fleet and we would basically put it up for bidding when we do our bids this year but they've asked for a do that donation of that vehicle for their school police officer and i just bring you to the board's decision to see what the board's opinion is jeff if this vehicle were to go to auction municipal auction what's the value probably a couple hundred dollars Again, I, I don't always agree with the Norman School District's fiscal policies, but it's a uh, community asset. 
for a lot of our residents. So I, I think it's a good move for the township. Put it on his motion yeah, for the meeting. Yeah. Okay. And then the final which then the final uh, part of my um, report, and actually I'm going to lean on uh, Mr. Blanco on this, is the culvert issue at uh, 99 Balot at Pellerino's Car Wash. We had a, uh, a major flooding incident there in September of this year, and it's kind of a reoccurring issue of a, uh, of a clogged pipe. On, it's a private pipe on private property with a clogged outlet, at least a clogged outlet. There may be more as you go upstream the pipe. But what I'm going to ask is uh, if Mr. Blanco can kind of Take the wheel here and drive us through here. Manager Soka provided you with some old correspondence, which I had in my file, uh, going from the fall of 2010 through December of 2011. And reading through all of that in preparation for this meeting, it tells a whole story about how we learned about this and what we learned about it and the landowner's response uh, to our violation notice. There is a culvert, which is 1,250 feet long. It is made of four foot diameter reinforced concrete pipe. And it runs from behind Jacktown Plaza. In fact, my paper file in my file cabinet, I've always called it Joeyo's culvert. That's where Joeyo's was and that was the upstream end. And it discharges down Portal Lane at Cooper Trading. So with that length, it's a quarter mile long. Um, it's significant. How that culvert came to be, I have to guess because I wasn't alive at the time it was installed. But Route 30 was built in its present alignment around 1937, 1938. Somebody who owned the property where Jackdown Plaza and Norwin Motors and Palerino's Car Wash said, wow, I've now got highway frontage if I could just do something with that pesky stream. So somebody made the decision, whether it was all one landowner or whether it was multiple landowners, to enclose that stream into a four foot diameter pipe. This is an aerial photograph from May 24th, 1939, I believe. I'm having a little hard time reading the text in the bottom corner. But you can see that there's raw earth out of the right of way of um, Route 30. And if you look real hard right above that tree line, you can see a meandering dark line running between the trees and Route 30. That's the stream. And yet you can see disturbed earth on both sides of it. I believe at that point, somebody was getting ready to enclose that stream and, and make it uh, usable property along the highway. This culvert starts in a depression behind Jacktown Plaza. Upstream of that, there's a pipe that carries the same stream underneath Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And then it daylights for a couple of hundred feet, and then it goes back into a pipe, which carries it underneath six different properties and Balot Avenue. That yellow circle shows the upstream end of the pipe. On a dry day, when you look down into that depression, it looks like that. It looks like a field. Uh, it's not mowed. It's not cut. There's a lot of uh, vegetation and brush down there. But when we get a major storm, it fills up. This was first brought to our attention by Bob Hume, who built Jackdown Plaza. He called us up back in 2009 and said, there's something wrong after a major storm. Uh, I'm getting a backup of water down here. So we went down there multiple times. We took photos. We documented it. We kept trying to inspect that pipe from the upstream end. We walked into it, Keith Evers and I, several times. It seems like every time we got in there to try to document conditions, eventually our lights would die and we'd have to abandon our inspection and come back out. Uh, what we didn't realize, and we should have, is you needed to come up from the downstream end. And eventually, when we were GPSing all of the storm sewers in the township in 2009, we GPSed the downstream end, and we looked up the pipe and said, oh my gosh, now we see what the problem is. Uh, the downstream end, as I mentioned, comes out at Cooper Trading, where I have the yellow circle on this diagram. And then it continues down through their property and eventually to Tinker's Run. 
If you look up from the downstream end, you will see, let me get you a date on this photo. There we go. This photo was taken on September 15th of 2010. And it was um, that day that I sent a letter to Joseph Iezzi, who was the agent for Mark Land's company that owns the bus garage. And what you can see here is that the reinforced concrete pipe is actually separated. And there's a, a pretty good gap between sections of pipe there into which soil from above that pipe has fallen. So there's been kind of a, a subsidence issue on the surface. And if you go out there now, you will see a depression where all that soil has fallen into the pipe and either blocked it or been washed away. What we're seeing here towards the left of the pipe uh, is the water trying to get around all that dirt and soil that's, that's uh, fallen through that joint into the pipe. Eventually, uh, Mr. Iezzi did hire a pipe inspection company and they tried to run a camera up that pipe from the downstream end. They got into it 41 feet when that camera was scraping on the top of the pipe and they couldn't go any further. But as you can see looking into the pipe, it continues to fill up beyond that. So at some point, uh, the pipe was significantly blocked off. In the winter of 2010 into 2011, we got a call one day from Pete Cooper at Cooper Trading. And he said, I've got something wrong down here. Can you come down? So I went down and we saw a river of water running down his driveway, coming out of a hole in the ground. I thought it was a water main break because you can see there's a water shutoff valve right there. And I thought, well, that's his service coming off in the main. There's a water main there that's failed. We immediately called the water company. They came out, they turned some valves, they listened, and they said, that, that isn't our pipe. That can't be. They said, we do have a pipe there, but we do not believe our pipe is leaking. So um, we scratched our heads and tried to figure out where, where it's coming from and why all this damage. What we didn't realize was that, let me not go to that picture yet. What was happening, that hole in the ground was a storm inlet that um, perhaps PennDOT put in, perhaps Cooper Trading put in years ago, that drained into this four foot diameter pipe. The water that couldn't get out of the four foot diameter pipe was flowing backwards up to this storm inlet and coming out and then running down the driveway. So the, the water was, there was enough head behind it, it was backed up enough up at the upstream end of the culvert that the elevations were the same, and it found its ex escape route by flowing backwards up this 15-inch pipe and then flowing down uh, Mr. Cooper's driveway. I show the 48-inch culvert there, and I show the 15-inch pipe that fed into it. So once the water flowed backwards and was coming up and out of that inlet, it followed that red hand-drawn line on there right above Portal Lane and was washing out the driveway. It got worse after a storm. It subsided a little bit when it was dry, but it flowed 24-7 as the stream does. So Mr. Iezzi hired Ligonier Construction, who built a bypass line, if you will. And that was this 24-inch pipe that I'm showing in yellow that picked up the flow from the 15-inch pipe and safely carried it in a 24-inch pipe down to about the same location where that 48-inch culvert originally ended. That was great as a temporary stopgap measure, but you can't put the flow that should go through a 48-inch pipe through a 15-inch pipe. That's where the downstream end of that 24-inch pipe dumps out and flows into the original stream channel and continues down through Cooper's Trading property. The original 48-inch pipe, and Manager Silk and I looked at it here last Thursday, you can just see the top of that pipe. For the most part, that pipe is, is occluded and blocked off. As you saw in my correspondence, I had some back and forth with Mr. Iezzi, and he said, there's nothing wrong with what we've done. There's no problem. Everything's flowing great. The water's making it through. The 15-inch pipe works just fine. If you look at the math, 
which us engineers like to do, the cross-sectional area of a 48-inch pipe is 1,809 square inches. The cross-sectional area of a 15-inch pipe is less than 10% of that. So that 15-inch pipe through which all water has to flow even to get to that 24-inch pipe, it, it's kind of like saying, well, the park, parkway's five lanes, but the Squirrel Hill Tunnel's only one. The capacity of the roadway isn't the five lanes. It's the narrowest part, which in this case is this 15-inch pipe. So my fear at that time, um, I believe, has been realized. There are tree limbs, tires, logs, shopping cart, leaf, litter, gosh knows what, that flows down through that 48-inch culvert. It was only a matter of time before it got so wedged full of the debris that it was not going to turn a 90 degree bend and go up a 15 inch pipe to be discharged, that it was going to clog itself off. Um, there's 243 acres upstream of this, so it's a fairly significant watershed, a little less than four tenths of a square mile. Um, I know we looked at this in early 2011 from the upstream end, and there was standing water 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I think what's happened between 2011 and now is that uh, this entire culvert is probably packed full of debris, uh, a quarter mile of debris, and how much, it is still flowing out the 24-inch pipe. We saw it flowing pretty well a week ago, but um, it's certainly not able to take everything that's coming down that valley. In dry weather, maybe, but not in a storm. Back in September, on September 10th, Palerino's car wash got the brunt, the brunt of this. What happened was that the basin behind Jacktown Plaza filled up to the point that it overflowed. And all of that water then came overland through their parking lot, through Westmoreland monuments, Norwin monuments, Westmoreland pools, across Ballot Avenue, Norwin Motors, Palerino's Car Wash, and eventually into the creek down by Cooper Trading. Um, that is the scene on September 10th. You can see there was easily two feet of water outside of Palerino's Car Wash. Uh, it picked up everything that wasn't bolted down and, and washed it to somewhere else. Um, you can see the extent of the, the water. It came in through the building. It broke through a garage door. Uh, it ruined a lot of uh, appliances and electronics. This was the um, credit card machine where you could pay for your car wash. That was wiped out. I, I think you told us $1,800 for a new one of those. That's $150. Okay. <laughs> so you can see there was some significant damage done to Palerino's car wash. Um, I have not heard of damage claims from any of the other businesses there, although it's pretty likely that they took on water as well. But the problem isn't going away. We talked about this back in 2011, and I urged the board to go after Mark Lands because the First Class Township Code has a provision in it that uh, no person shall stop, fill up, confine, pave, or otherwise interfere with any drain, ditch, water course, or drainage facilities in a township without first submitting suitable plans thereof to the township commissioners for their approval. Now certainly, the property owners there, I think, have a civil action against Mark Lands for the blockage of this pipe. I know one of the arguments that was made back in 2011 was that I couldn't prove to you that there weren't other parts of the pipe that were failing, and that's very true. I can't. That pipe may be in horrible shape the whole way up. However, the only way to inspect a pipe once it's blocked is to work from the bottom, remove the blockage, and then inspect the next section upstream of that. Um, at this point, I'm not even sure how you would clean it or inspect it. They had contracted with that pipe cleaning company that did the televising. They looked at the pipe and they said, it's cracked longitudinally. There's no way we're going in there and risking somebody's life to go in and try and remove debris. They were afraid that the, the thing would just let loose and somebody would end up 
drowning inside that pipe. But you can see the crack along the, the top of the pipe. Um, very visible right here, just the first section this side of the opening of the, the failed joint there. You can see that um, crack that runs the length of the pipe at the top. You can also see a crack along the right side and the left side. What happens uh, when that fails, the top cracks in and then the sides cut loose. It's like a hinge. So as the top starts to subside and the pipe becomes egg-shaped, the next place you see a fracture is on the long, along the sides of the pipe. So th the sad part is that pipe is under maybe 40, 50, 60 feet of fill. It would be an incredible expense to go down and dig that up. And Mr. Iezzi had told me back in 2011, push too hard and we'll just file for bankruptcy. All right, but we've got a mess on our hands. There's, there's that pipe somehow, that stream somehow has to get from the behind Jacktown Plaza down to Cooper Trading. There's, there's, it's got to flow downhill. There's no other way to do it. Now, maybe if you were to put a new pipe in, maybe it wouldn't have to be quite as deep, um, although it would still be significantly deep. If you look at the contours up at uh, Jacktown Plaza, Great. that's easily 25, 30 feet below the parking lot to get down to where that pipe begins. And as the pipe goes downhill, it only gets deeper going further. So somebody has had the benefit for 60, 65 years of having the use of that property. It was their decision to enclose it. It's not a township pipe. We don't have an easement. There's no evidence that we put the pipe in. Um, do we want to spend taxpayer dollars trying to go in there and fix it? Or is that an expense that should be borne by the landowners? Uh, Mr. Iezzi, on behalf of Mark Lance, has said, I'm not going to do anything, even though I know there's a failure under my property. So I, I guess that brings us to the decision tree, what do we want to do? Uh, it wasn't going to fix itself. I think it was only a matter of time before that pipe became completely choked off. I think we're pretty close to being there. What we're asking for tonight is if there's more consensus for us to start pursuing the landowner of this pipe, at, you know, and then work our way up and, you know, if we can get, can get in, see other landowners, and then, you know, just be a, a domino effect going up of enforcement. But this, you know, this is one that we don't own. This problem we don't own, how you know, and we'd like to uh, try to get relief for the property owners upstream to be able to have the water flow down. Yep. Yep. I was going to say, if Andy, I a question for you, is that concrete pipe all the way? Is that from top to bottom? Concrete? It is. It is. It, it, at least as far in as we got. So you don't know how much is separated or is not no. separated? or I don't. There could be a bunch of that. Possibly. Although my guess is that and you've seen this so so often culverts underneath multiple properties everybody did their own thing right. this guy used corrugated metal this guy used old water heater tanks this guy used uh, clay pipe you name it uh, it does appear at least looking from the upstream end and the downstream end that this was all done at the same time with the same type of pipe the joint lengths are consistent the diameter is consistent it's the same material yeah I'm in favor of Going after those people. Yeah. Yep. Just just to make sure, Bruce, do you have any thoughts on on how well, we proceed? I just, I just want to make sure that we continue to say that this is a private matter. I have no problem enforcing the uh, uh, first class township code or any other ordinances that might come into play here, but I don't want us to do anything to, in some fashion. Uh, appear to be taking over this line because we're not. This is a private property owner that has a problem that's affecting others. It's become a nuisance, and as such, you know, you can you can enforce the township code. Um, but I don't want anybody digging up there from our our uh, township. I don't want anybody uh, taking any steps to try to remediate the problem from the township standpoint. So everybody is on notice that so we're not doing any of that. We're going we're gonna to enforce our ordinances uh, as Andy's outlined. Andy, one other question. 
going down that Cooper's trading, there's a building on the left. Is that taking water too? I would not think so. Used to be a, I think a machine shop. Now it's an auto auto place repair shop. I, I know there were concerns back in 2011 when Mr. Cooper called us that at that point uh, they were seeing water from the 15 inch pipe that was discharging at that hole in the ground, which turned out to be an inlet and running down the driveway. Since that 24 inch pipe went in, that's gotten the water away from that building and it, you can see it's coming down now to where the original stream channel was. Um, when and if there's another event like happened back in September where the water overflows the basin and starts coming overland, I'm not sure that's the first place it would end up. I think it's more likely to come around behind the car wash across the parking lot of the bus garage and come down that way. Okay, thank you. Andy, just so I know, when's the last time you talked to this uh, property owner? When's the last time you had correspondence with him? The last correspondence we had was... I'm seeing 2010 in here. Probably around has 2011. There, has, there, has there been one since... Looks like December of 2011. Okay, and you said that there was a flooding that took place this past September? Correct. Okay, so there's been no given, no notice given to him about that? No. At, so far. Okay, I think that's where you start. I think you, you, you know, let's let's get our heads together and put together a writing to him. And then I, I think, the more I think about this, this may take on the characteristics probably most effectively of, of possibly seeking an injunction in the court of common pleas because we're not going to get anywhere in front of the district judge on this. It's too big for him to be able to deal with. He's not going to, he's not going to be able to handle this. I mean, all we can do is fine him a few hundred dollars. You know, what you need is somebody to, to order him to make the repairs and that only comes from the court of common pleas. So that's where I would think the direction would go after we give them notice. Okay, you and I can work together yeah, we can on, do that. on how we approach that. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Mayor Silka. All right, Andy, you're up again. I'm Mr. Blinko, Planning and Engineering Topics. This one's easy. <laughs> we have one item coming from the Planning Commission tonight. Um, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Church used to have a uh, training center administrative building uh, on an adjacent lot. They have sold that building to waste management and now they would like to build a new building on their original lot adjacent to their parking lot as you see with the yellow rectangle here. It would be parish offices. Um, it could be used for small meetings, small conferences. It's not that big of a building. It's about 3,000 square feet. But um, they uh, filed for a site plan application other than stormwater management and the construction of the building itself uh, they would not be adding any parking or really changing the land very much uh, this would be used mostly by staff during the week versus sunday services where people would be uh, there at, at those times this building probably would not be in use they want to do an engineered metal building. They told us it would be a dark green color. The bottom three feet would be masonry or um, uh, field stone. And um, they've submitted a site plan. The biggest thing that the Planning Commission was concerned about was that the gas line easement along the front of that lot wasn't interfered with by the building. And in fact, the building had to be moved a little bit to get out of it. But um, the Planning Commission does recommend approval of this contingent upon uh, stormwater and erosion control plan approval from the conservation district. They need to get sewage planning approval from DEP. NHTMA would like to see their sewer line design because they're concerned with the depth of it. Um, they would want to enter into it. We would want them to enter into a property stormwater O&M agreement so we can go in and inspect their facilities from time to time. And then there were some engineering review items. They did bring in revised plans this afternoon. I've not had an opportunity to look at them before the meeting tonight, but hopefully that addresses all of those comments. I have requested in my memo that we waive 
the uh, commercial developers agreement on this because other than building the building itself there's no new parking there's no major earthwork there's no uh, infrastructure literally they're going to build this building next to the parking lot and put in a sidewalk so uh, it, it seems like more trouble than it's worth to go through and bond a sidewalk but uh, the building itself will be um, right adjacent to the lot and everything else is existing thanks any questions for mr. Blinko thank you okay thank you not seeing any old business on uh, Jennifer and I any further board comments Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Seven to zero. Meeting adjourned. Eight oh eight.